So um, Thich Nhat Hanh has said, when you have enough understanding and compassion in you, then that amount of understanding and compassion will try to express itself in action. And your practice should help you to cultivate more understanding and more compassion. And our hope is that tonight we cultivate more understanding that can lead to compassionate action. Breathing in, I can feel I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I can feel I'm breathing out. Breathing in, I'm arriving here in this circle of friends, of learners. Breathing out, I invite my body, my mind, and my heart to be at ease. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, everyone. Uh, again, maybe some of you heard uh, at the beginning, but we have the honor to have Brenda Perez as our curator for this series. And she has done an amazing work. So I'm going to read a little bit about Brenda, and then she's going to introduce our speaker tonight. So Brenda Perez, she, her, ella is a local DC award-winning community activist who is passionate about fighting for the liberation of Mother Earth and oppressed people of color. Originally from Netzahuatl in Mexico, she has been living in DC since 2006. Though she began to notice disparities early on as she navigated the public education system, her formal introduction to organizing spaces happened on the retraining of movement matters, where she met other students who were organizing to address issues that were affecting them. In high school, she began to organize around language, just, language justice and the broader immigrant rights movement. She continues to organize and is currently working at the New Deal for Youth at the Center for Law and Social Policy to propose policy changes that provide more economic opportunities for youth. She has a master's degree in water resources management from the University of the District of Columbia and is a program analyst for DOEES Office of Urban Agriculture, where her efforts focus on finding new ways to make public funds more accessible to urban farmers to reduce food insecurity and create more opportunities to grow food locally. Recognizing that climate change is a time sensitive issue, she strives to be inclusive and open up spaces for action in communities that have been impacted disproportionately. Brenda, Brenda is now here with us and she's gonna have the space. Thank you so much, Brenda, and uh, welcome everyone again. Hi everybody, it's so nice to see you again. Um, thank you to those that came back uh, to watch this uh, second part of this series. Um, I really appreciate you. And if you haven't seen the first presentation, I really recommend it. It's, it's on the Make Invisible website and um, it's, it's really beautiful. And Annie, Adriana, again, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to curate the series. Um, I've been in community with a lot of these folks and to be able to bring them to this space and uplift their stories and share with you guys uh, these amazing people that I know is, you know, incredible to me. Um, and with the idea of these series, um, I explained a little bit last time, but it, it, 
it's really to understand environmental justice from a intersectional perspective. Um, and just like how climate change is becoming more and more complicated, and we are starting to understand how it ties to other systems of oppression, that means that our solutions have to be just as intersectional and just as complicated as the problems that we have. And so when I was thinking about the speakers for these series, I was thinking about indigenous people who are really exploring the intersection between um, many things, but um, really a focus on environmental justice and indigenous self-determination. And what does it mean for indigenous, for indigenous people to find that self-determination and what does it mean for, um, for it to be a solution to climate change? So a lot of the things that you're gonna hear throughout these series are gonna be complicated, um, but take it all in. And a lot of it probably is gonna be new information, uh, but just, you know, like keep in mind that, you know, this is a space of learning. Uh, and so ask questions with the intent to learn. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited today about our speaker for today, Ashton. Um, We've been in community for a couple of years now, and Ashton is just a wealth of knowledge, and she's so amazing. And every time I get to sit down with her, I always ask her a little bit about like the work that she's doing or the work that she's doing at school, just to try to you know like pick her brain a little bit, and I'll share Ashton's uh, bio. And then I'll pass the mic to, to Ashton so that she can uh, begin her presentation. So Ashton is an Antico Lenny Lenape and Jamaican PhD candidate from the University of Minnesota, Minnesota's American Studies Department. As her heart lies at the connections made between the between African diasporic indigenous and turtle, turtle island indigenous community communities, her work and research lies at the intersections of critical indigenous studies and critical black studies, exploring the histories of black, of black and antical Napi people from her homelands uh, at the tides, at the tide waters of the Delaware Bay. She considers herself as an Afro indigenous feminist, thinking often about the intimate connection between black and native peoples and their connection to the land, water, and more than human beings as, and more than human beings and the grandmothers of her, in her life who have passed ancestral knowledge of these relations down to her. So I'm so excited to have her and Ashton, I'm gonna pass the mic to you and thank you for being here. I'm so happy that you accepted this opportunity to speak in this space. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me and thank you for that introduction. I'm super, super excited to be here. Um, hi, everybody. Hey, uh, my name is Ashton Pamapani Dunkley. Um, yeah, there's like, there's the, I guess, more Western way of introducing myself, right? Um, my, uh, my name, Ashton, my occupation. Um, I'm a, I'm a, what am I? <laughs> um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm currently living on Minnesota Makoche on Dakota homelands. Um, I am a part of a critical indigenous studies cohort here that really works on looking at um, indigenous issues incredibly intersectionally. I'm really lucky to be a part of a cohort of indigenous peoples um, from all across the globe who are thinking about their community, thinking about self-determination in their community, thinking about what indigenous sovereignty and land back and uh, environmental justice and all these amazing things look like in their communities. Um, so I'm really excited about that and super excited that um, following my cohort was a cohort of critical black studies um, scholars who are all thinking about different communities in the African diaspora, thinking about um, thinking about similar issues, thinking about what self-determination means for Black peoples, um, for 
uh, indigenous African peoples of the African diaspora, um, the about liberation, joy, Afro femi Af like black feminisms, music, um, the land, really cool thing. So that's a long way of saying that I'm around a lot of really cool people here um, and they very much have shaped the way that I think about my work. Um, so most of what I say, they will have probably already said better, but I will try my best here. <laughs> um, and then also I'm very much so learning um, from being here on Minnesota Makoche on Dakota homelands. Um, I learn every day about what my responsibilities are to Dakota peoples um, and to Dakota lands and also have made a lot of really amazing friendships with Dakota people here. Um, as well as Anishinaabe people who are indigenous, um, who are the indigenous peoples of um, the, the north. <laughs> I just I always call it up north because one of my best friends is um, is indigenous from the Fond du Lac um, Fond du Lac Nation up north uh, near Duluth, and yes, so very grateful to all of them here, uh, and then especially grateful to. Um, all the people who make me me, um, you know, without ever like explicitly saying it, my grandmother, uh, my mom's mom, who we call my mom, um, <laughs> she taught us that the most important part, right, of any Nanticoke Lenape introduction is not introducing who you are as an individual, um, because it there's no such thing really. Um, but rather thinking and introducing yourself and uplifting the people you're in relation to, who you're in relation to, and by who I mean both people and the land and more than human peoples. Um, the best way for me to introduce myself is for me to tell you from who and where I come from, um, rather than my degrees. Um, <laughs> um, because that honestly has taught me more in my life um, than than anything, so I'm uh, super grateful. Um, my people come from the island of Jamaica and the Nanticoke and Lenape nations of Lenape Hoking, which is the land of the Lenape, um, currently known as Delaware in New Jersey. Um, Lenape Hoking also includes spaces um, such as the southeastern part of Pennsylvania and um, the so more southern parts of New York. Uh, I'm the daughter of Spencer Dunkley and Denise Ashton, the granddaughter of Lola Banton, uh, Claudia Sasanto Dunkley, Cordelia Durham, and Oscar L. Ashton Jr., who's my namesake. Um, so shout out to him. <laughs> um, I come from the ancient people of the Tidewaters. Uh, my people are from the Tidewaters of the Delaware Bay. Um, I largely, I think about my relationships to this world and recognize the fact that I largely come from watery spaces. My people are from rivers and swamps and bays and beaches, um, trees like pine and palm. My people are fishers and farmers and storytellers and healers. Um, they like sassafras tea and sorrel tea. Um, I'm coming from really intimate connections between black and native peoples. Um, and unfortunately for most of my life, that was a connection that I believe despite my very existence uh, to be an impossibility for much of my life. Um, I have spent a lot of time in grad school and throughout my life thinking about why that is. And, um, you know, I grew up within a settler state that's constructed in a very specific way, and it's constructed in a way that allows for them to deny the existence of my people, to deny the existence of Nanticoke Lenape peoples um, on my homelands, and also that allows them to racialize, subjugate, and oppress Black peoples and deny them any connection to a land space whatsoever. Um, I have been thinking a lot about the title for um, our talk today, mostly because I was like, man, what do I talk about? Um, so <laughs> I made it really simple. I just like went to the title and was thinking about what does it mean when we're thinking about indigenous led environmental justice movements. Um, 
And I was just reflecting on and would definitely like to ask you to reflect upon like who you see impacted and included when you're thinking about indigenous led environmental movements. Um, and I want to draw attention to the ways that diasporic black communities are frequently excluded from conversations of indigeneity. Um, despite literally being colonized and displaced indigenous peoples right who were care who continually carry their indigenous ways of knowing and understanding the world, um, understanding the stars, they're carrying that knowledge, understanding plants, et cetera. Um, as I said, I've spent a good portion of my life grappling about what it means to be Afro-Indigenous, a Jamaican and Nance Copeland Abe person growing up on my ancestral homelands where settlers repeatedly um, have claimed and asserted that my people don't exist. It was something that I heard really frequently growing up. There are no native people in Delaware. There are no native people in New Jersey. Native people all went out west. They're just like very common tropes. Um, tropes like the myth of the vanishing Indian, all of those things uh, greatly impacted the way I was allowed to understand myself uh, as a person in that space. Um, and that goes as far as to thinking about school textbooks, thinking about uh, the displays that were and weren't in our libraries, just, you know, it's manifest in so many different ways. Um, these really, these myths that are really ingrained into like settler colonialism. Um, I'm gonna, I also just wanna say, um, that when we're thinking about settler colonialism, all these isms get like really confusing. <laughs> um, and I just like, I think the best way for folks to think about settler colonialism, right? You have a settler colonial power in this case, in the case of my people, um, you know, the Dutch, the Swedish, uh, the British, Euro-American powers coming into our homelands coming into onto Turtle Island indigenous lands um, with the goal of claiming those lands as their own and making those lands their own, um, which in order to do so means removing indigenous peoples from those lands physically, removing them from those lands in the form of some narrative um, thinking that there may not be indigenous people or forgetting to remember indigenous peoples. That's the ways that we were taught in K through 12 education to relate to Turtle Island indigenous histories. Um, so it's right. So when you're thinking about settler colonialism, some people say like, like displace and erase indigenous presences. Um, that's their goal, but then also really important to remember that like they didn't do it. <laughs> uh, indigenous peoples have remained on their ancestral homelands and indigenous peoples who were unfortunately removed from their ancestral homelands have still maintained those identities within themselves. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that real quick. Um, but yeah, it was hard. It was hard growing up in a space where you're constantly being told in one way or another that you don't exist. Um, you don't exist, they might say, because you're not a real authentic native. You don't have a specific blood quantum. You're too mixed with one thing or the other to have an indigenous identity where indigenous identities have never been about uh, blood quantum. Those are settler made things. Those are settler systems and ideas. Um, Indigenous identity has always been about kinship and a connection to land um, and our relationships to land and to, and to one another. Um, and, you know, so there, there were those things that you're not authentic enough. Um, I also, you know, was repeatedly told that I didn't have a connection to Lenape Hoking, um, the land I grew up on because I am black. Um, and Black people are so frequently denied a relationship to land, as I was saying, a connection to land. Um, African Indigenous peoples, right, who have recognized themselves as Igbo, Yoruba, Fulani, um, they're stolen from their homelands. Um, 
and placed within a racial category that justifies their displacement, their enslavement, and their exploitation. Those are my ancestors that I unfortunately can't name because I've been so far removed from that, but those cultural identities are carried on in other ways within, within me. Um, I think it's so important to think about the ways that indigenous peoples from Turtle Island and African and the African diaspora have been differently racialized by the colonial state in ways that like justify genocide, justify enslavement, uh, justify their exploitation and oppression. And it manifests in different ways, but there's a common, there's a common thread here. Um, and looking at those solidarities is super, super important. Um, thinking about how you can include um, how you can include people within indigenous led environmental justice movements in ways that don't reify really anti-black settler understandings of what it means to be indigenous. Um, I, you know, like those, and those things are very much so on purpose, right? From a very early age in this country's history it was recognized by colonial powers that it is not beneficial to have solidarities between Black and Native communities. Um, that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, that doesn't work for the settler state. It's easier to, to for lack in words, divide, divide and try to conquer um, rather than uh, risk having those peoples together. And so you think of different ways that you can separate them or remove one from the conversation. Um, I think one of the other things that I think about when I'm trying to think through these ideas um, is how broadening our understanding of who's indigenous can help us to like grow and create new solidarities in the environmental justice movement. Uh, we know that black and indigenous communities, i.e. indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis, by a lack of access to clean water and air and healthy foods. And they're constantly on the front lines fighting for the right to live and determine their own futures. Um, I think it's really important for um, folks, especially indigenous folks within Turtle Island, I think to ask, um, what recognizing Black peoples as indigenous might reveal about the responsibility of decolonial movements and the environmental justice movement towards dismantling anti-Blackness, because they're very much so related. Um, what could, right, what could an indigenous future be for all of our relations when Black liberation lies at the center of the fight for indigenous self-determination and sovereignty? These are just things that I'm like constantly thinking through, <laughs> constantly thinking through. And I think they're really important things to center when you're thinking about indigenous led environmental movements, because it's a conversation that gets left out a lot. Um, thinking through like, what does it mean if we think about indigenous solidarity? Um, you know, thinking about No Dapple and Flint, um, like thinking about how Black and Indigenous experiences come together and where they might be stronger together. Um, yeah, so those are my ideas for that. And then I was thinking a lot about. Um, one of my favorite quotes this year, I like pick a new favorite quote to obsess over. Um, this, is the, this is the new one. Um, it's by Bell Hooks, who is one of my favorite scholars ever. Um, and a lot of folks don't talk about the fact that Bell Hooks is Afro-Indigenous, um, but she is. And so like, that's really sick. And <laughs> um, there's a book she's written called Black Looks, Race and Representation, which has a picture of her grandmother on it. Her grandmother is literally Afro-Indigenous. So there's a picture of an Afro-Indigenous woman on the front of this book. So you can tell why I'm biased towards it, but it's also a good quote. Um, it says, for Native Americans, especially those who are Black and for African-Americans, it's a gesture of resistance to the dominant culture's ways of thinking about history, identity, and community for us to decolonize our minds 
and reclaim the word that is our history as it was told to us by our ancestors, not as it's been interpreted by the colonizer. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about what that means to reclaim what our history is as it's been told to us by our ancestors. And it's something that I've been working to center in my work. Um, I get really caught up in thinking about um, really like, like settler interpretations of my people. And I'm like, that's messed up. They shouldn't have said that. And it's really frustrating. Um, and the only solace I've gotten from that is trying to reshift my focus, not to say that that's not important. Those are things that need to be unpacked um, and that I do work to unpack in my work. Um, but I refuse to let them take center stage anymore. Um, that's not the main focus of my work. The main focus of my work is uplifting the relationships that my ancestors have had to land and uplifting the ways that my ancestors understand themselves as indigenous people um, over all else, over the ways that we've been interpreted and racialized and recategorized by the settler colonial state. Um, so yeah, that's something that I've just been like mulling over. Uh, and then as I, as I was thinking about what we were gonna talk about today. Um, <laughs> I was also thinking about defending the sacred, right? And what it means, um, what it means to defend the sacred. What, what do I hold as sacred personally? And like, what has made them sacred to me? What has made them so important and revealed, revered um, and vital to me and my people? And then of course, like, how do we defend them? Cause that's the, like, that's the most important. And then like, what are we defending them from? Um, so to sort of get at that, because I was having a trouble getting at that, I was looking through some of the things that I've written in the past. Um, some like pieces that I don't share often, um, mostly because they're really special to me. I like find them and I was like, ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, so I decided I would share it here. I was like, why not? I'll share it here. Um, I wrote a series of letters last year when I was in like a really difficult place. Um, I guess you could call it like more of a creative writing piece. Um, my advisor said she like thought of it as like theorizing indigenous ways of knowing and like our relationships to land, which for sure could be, but to keep it simple, it's just a letter. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I wrote a series of letters. This is one of them. Each one is written to like relatives or ancestors, bodies of water, um, family members, and to myself even and in a true Scorpio fashion. They're all just like anonymous, anonymously initialed, addressed to like the initial A and then like sign from the letter A, just things that might confuse you as I read. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, let's see. Oh yeah, so I think for me, like you spend so long having your identity and your connection to place questioned and dissected and discounted and denied and having to prove who you are that you, like you start to feel lost. Like there's a lot of things going on um, and for me, this letter is about uh, how recognizing and honoring embodied knowledge and traditional ecological practices and honoring the land and paying attention to land has helped me to feel grounded again. Um, and hopefully like if I do start sharing this with folks it helps them to feel grounded again, the full series, but yeah. Um, so I will, I'm gonna read it. Um, what's up, A? Eh? I've been sitting here in one of our places, favorite places, the Apoquinimic, trying to figure out what to write for my geography paper. I thought maybe if I sat outside with my notebook and watched the river flow and the vulture circle above that I might learn something about the land that I could then write about. Now I'm starting to wonder if I'm going to learn anything at all with this pen and, my, and paper in my hand. My heart tells me no. 
how can I listen and look and learn if I've got my head in a notebook thinking about what I'm going to write next? Yet here I am struggling to write everything I think and see and hear down, and I'm starting to think it's a fool's errand. I know I could never write it all down. Our world, our relations, our apoquinomic is far too expansive for these pages, and I'm literally running out of ink. Yet here I am trying to, with all my might to stop the wind from slapping this book shut and tossing loose pages into the sky. Why, why am I clinging onto this damn book, desperately licking the top of this pen, probably ingesting more ink at this point than I'm getting onto the page? I don't know. I guess I'm worried I'll forget something. How will I remember if I don't write it all down? How have we remembered? One of the most well-known books about my people is called Delaware's Forgotten Folks. It was written in the 40s by a white local historian, C.A. Westlogger, and lover of all things salvage anthropology, especially all things written by Frank Speck. He, following in the footsteps of Frank Speck, was worried that our people would forget everything about ourselves if he, a white academic, didn't write it down and prove that we exist to other settlers. But we, we were remembering and existing just fine up until that point, weren't we? After all, he did have to come to our community and interview our elders so he could learn what we already knew and then put it in a book. But somehow we're the forgetful ones and the forgotten ones, but I must ask forgotten to who? That's the odd thing about Western understandings of knowledge. It's all or nothing, i.e. it's a lie because no one person, no one people, no one nation or generation could ever know it all. The settler state often claims to know better to know it all, to know better, to know, the pro to know progress and civilization, to know us better than we know ourselves. They say we have to prove ourselves, prove how authentic we are, measure up to their blood quantums, prove it, prove how much, prove what we know of our ancestors past as if the state hadn't for centuries deliberately worked to strip us of that knowledge of our homelands, of our stories and of our songs. They call us inauthentic. They call us whatever names and categories and races they constructed and then see fit to call us that day. And then they pretend we're forgotten. Just because you don't know everything doesn't mean that you don't know anything. You are valid. Trust that you'll know what you need to know when you need to know it because that ancestral knowledge lives within you. It's embodied. Shoot, you might even know it now and just not know it yet, you know? I asked you once before and I'll ask you once again, instead of being consumed by the thought of everything you don't know, tell me what you do know. For example, I know you might be shaking your head right now and rolling your eyes at me. I knew you would when I wrote this paragraph in the most annoyingly repetitive way possible, but I also knew it would make you laugh. If you're not sure right now, I can tell you we know just as our ancestors did what it feels like to hear the tidewaters lap and whoosh under the warmth of the sun. And we know the beauty of moonlight on the marshlands. Is that not tradition? We know the excitement of pulling fish in, from the muddy waters of the Apoquinimic. Is that not keeping tradition? We know the warmth of gathering strawberries with our grandmother in the summer sun. I know that must be tradition. We know pole beans and corn and bushels of crabs. We know the joy of gathering around a pile of clams and emptying their shells while the air and our bellies fill with laughs. I know that's tradition. We know all of that and so much more, not because we wrote it down or dug it out of an archive or read it in some salvage anthropologist's book. We know that because the land taught it to us and we remembered to listen. Listening to you always, a. So that's the letter. Um, thank you um, <laughs> for the heart. Um, yeah, that's the letter. And for me, it's really about, or also about this generation's long and like deep and intimate connection to and relationship to land. Um, and when I say this, I also wanna recognize that indigenous peoples are indigenous peoples 
everywhere, even when they've been displaced and disconnected in some way from their homelands, because we literally like within our being, like are the land. <laughs> um, it's within us that knowledge. The, another thing I was trying to make clear is that like that knowledge we hold is embodied. Um, and that relationship is so, so, so sacred. Um, I was really, really lucky to grow up as I did on the Apoquinimic, um, even in points where I was like, I didn't feel that lucky. But like now looking back, I realized that that was, um, that was a really great thing um, to at least, at the very least, if you're in a space where it doesn't feel like indigenous peoples are recognized nearly at all, and definitely not nearly as much as the founding fathers. Um, I grew up in one of those like colonial reenactment type towns. <laughs> um, to know that the land still remembers you is so special. Um, and you know, ap the Apoquinimink literally translates to um, the place we stayed for a long time. And one of the other things that I write in this series of letters is that even though I hadn't, you know, people within my community um, have like lost their language because of so many different things, um, forced colonial assimilation, churches not allowing us to speak our language, um, I could go on and I've been like slowly in the process of trying to relearn Lenape, which is a long process, but like I'm trying. <laughs> um, and that's when I learned what the Apoquinimic meant, the place we stayed for a long time. But I already knew that right within my being that we had been there in that space a long time before I had, even though I was disconnected through colonial violence from my language. So it's just like, those embodied knowledges are so important to recognize and honor. Um, I'm also though very specific about the way, about my wording in that piece, um, because even though I recognize that I'm lucky enough to be pulling up fish from the Apoquinimic River, right? I also know the pain of knowing that those waters are poisoned. They're literally poisoned. Um, knowing that the fish, that fish relative is poisoned, um, that my family can't eat that fish without being poisoned. So we can pull it up and be excited about it. Um, but then somewhere deep within you, you know that like you've been disconnected from that practice, from that tradition, from sometimes that fish sturgeon, um, an indigenous fish to this, to this land. I'm, this land back home, I'm in Minnesota, um, is nearly extinct. Um, and that's sad. <laughs> um, Delaware has the most polluted streams and rivers and estuaries out of any state in this nation. Um, for those of you in DC, <laughs> it's real close, unfortunately. Um, or just like anywhere on the East Coast, right? Because in the midst of a global climate crisis, like you're, you're always downstream. You're always downstream from somewhere that's being violently poisoned um, from some waters that aren't being respected the ways that they should. Um, but in March of this past year, reports by the Environmental Integrity Project, um, they determined that 97% of their like over well over a thousand miles of Delaware waterways were assessed to be too polluted to meet the Clean Water Act standards, um, which are already pretty low, um, and and too polluted for people to swim, uh, to drink, for aquatic life, to live healthy lives, and of course, like too polluted for my people to continue doing traditional like our traditional food ways to continue eating clam, shad, perch, fish, cat, like catfish, um, sturgeon, a hundred percent of the estuaries that they tested were also deemed similarly impaired, similarly poisoned. Um, the same for in New Jersey, which is again is Lenape hoking, um, Lenape land where 97% of estuaries were heavily polluted as well as 95% of rivers and streams. Um, 
I grew up almost thinking it was normal for like to hear like neighbors be like, oh, you can only eat fish once a year because like then your body can like process the poisons that are like in it if you're gonna fish from the river. Um, and then to also be thinking like, I really want to fish. I really want to continue to know how to do that and to be able to pass that on to my kids, to pass the, to know how to crab. I hear like my grandma talking about stories about crabbing and things um, about like catching muskrats. Those are all things that I would love to carry on. Um, but if we catch it, I mean, you can always throw back. So that's what we do. But still um, to not know that taste and to not know the enjoyment of eating that meal um, is really heartbreaking. And, and really like, is it any surprise that this land and this water and its indigenous habit inhabitants were some of the first to experience really immense colonial violence and destruction by occupying colonial powers. Some of the very first and any coincidence that Lenape people were the first to sign a broken treaty with this, these United States. There has been, th these lands have been exploited and poisoned by colonial powers for an incredibly long time. Um, but my people still persist there. And that's something that I also want to make very clear um, is that we're still there and we're still fighting for the water um, and we're still hanging out and doing things on the water. I'm still gonna like learn to weave like reeds into baskets and mats. <laughs> um, those are all super important things that we're still going to continue to do. Um, but that's how layered this environmental justice movement is, this, how layered this climate crisis is, is that it impacts the deepest, most intimate parts of the ways that we live our lives as indigenous peoples, as brown peoples, as black peoples. BIPOC communities are always on the front lines of these, of these issues as already marginalized peoples from all other, from all other directions. Um, I wanted, I guess almost like a realization that I came to this year that has been really helpful for me when I'm thinking about how pervasive settler colonialism is and the ways that it sort of operates. It's been really helpful for me to think about um, colonialism as disconnection. And I learned that from the writings of a Dakota scholar um, who's from these lands, Wazi Atawin, shout out. If you haven't read Wazi Atawin's work, um, really good, what does justice look like? Right now I'm thinking about the paradox of indigenous resurgence at the end of empire, um, but they're all good, but all, all good writings with all good titles. Um, but from that, I really got thinking about how colonialism operates to disconnect peoples from their relations. Um, Waz is really thinking about how settler colonialism has operated to disconnect indigenous peoples from their homelands, from their land. Um, I think it works just as well to think about a lot, like a full, from all your relations, right? Um, something you hear in Indian country a lot. It's like all my relations. Um, there is a way, right? You're like removing indigenous peoples from their homelands. That's a form of disconnection. Um, to, to not know, to not have grown up knowing my language is a form of disconnection. Um, and yes, it impacts me as a Nanticoke Lenape person, but it also impacts every single person that is living on and occupying my homelands because the state has been structured in a way that works to disconnect all of us from all of our relations. Um, for example, one of the examples that Waz gives um, in this piece is a quote from, let's see if I can find it. Um, it's a quote from environmental activist and author, Derek Jensen. Um, 
but he's asking, he asks, right, who feeds you? Who, what is your source of life and to whom do you owe your life? And then he remarks, if you experience far deeper than belief or perception that your food comes from a grocery store and your water comes from a tap, from the economic system, from the social system we call a civilization, it is to this that you will pledge back your life. If you experience the social system as your source of life, this capitalist, patriarchal, commercial system as your source of life, then you will be responsible to this social system and you will defend this social system to your very death. Um, inversely, right, Waz thinks about how our ancestors, indigenous peoples who have found daily sustenance from the land and from forests and from the water have always understood that their survival was directly dependent on their capacity to defend homelands. Um, and so like when we're thinking about making visible, one of the things I like was hoping to make visible and to think about making visible with you all is like, how do we make more visible like all of our relationships to land um, and I really think that comes with uplifting indigenous ways of knowing uplifting indigenous peoples and listen listening to them when they say hey you are poisoning our water water is life um mini wachoni water water is life right um I think that it's so important when we think about how this disconnection is operating um, and how it's impacting all of our lives and making, even if it's implicitly um, incredibly loyal to a system that ultimately is only gonna work to harm us, is only gonna continue to fuel the climate crisis, right? Um, grow your own food. <laughs> I've been trying this year, um, after reading this, I see your thumbs up, Brenda. Um, I started a garden, so I'm really excited about that. And it does, it really amplifies like in your head, like, wow, this is where my, like I ate from this today and I need to defend this if I want to eat this again. <laughs> um, yeah, where, where am I on time, Brenda? <laughs> uh, we have until 8.30. Uh, and we can leave some time for questions, so. Yes, okay. Well then I will wrap up. I just wanted to make sure I didn't start rant, ranting. Um, but yeah, no, love the land, love food, um, love water. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I wanted to, I guess just really try to, think about with you all and emphasize the importance of, yes, recognizing that colonialism operates as a system of disconnection. Um, but then that means reconnection, right? Is like super like anti-colonial and revolutionary to think about how we're reconnecting with one another, think about how we're reconnecting communities, how we can reconnect with the land. Like when we are building those intimate relationships, like we know we're doing something really good. Um, and if you haven't listened to Tomas's talk um, from the last session, I loved it. Um, and I think it was super like just, well, all around super amazing. But one of the things that I loved about it was how much Tomas was emphasizing like reconnecting with yourself. Um, that is like kind of reconnecting with the land, right? Cause if we are the land, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> reconnecting with yourself and honoring yourself. Um, those are all things that ultimately work to disrupt a system that relies on us being siloed and being individualized. Um, I love the way that we started this talk, um, just like reconnecting with our bodies. Annie saying like, how important it was for us to like reconnect with our bodies and to take those breaths so that we can learn and listen better. And that is something that helps us to learn and listen better is when we're trying to connect. Um, there's a reason that it's like difficult in like a capitalist system to like 
learn and listen because it's just like all disconnection like we want to make those connections with each other and to listen and to be open so I really appreciate you creating that space um I appreciate all of you here for like coming and connecting with one another um this is like a space of connection um us all here together um Brenda, thanks for connecting with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm just like super grateful to be here. Um, but I'm tired of hearing myself talk. So let's let's chat <laughs> um, if anybody has questions or anything. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Ashton. Thank you so much. Um, when you were reading the letter, I, I like started tearing up because I was like, you know, like, these are some of the thoughts that I have sometimes, you know, and just to like rehear them and hear your thought process. And this whole idea that you even just wrote a letter that it's, it's just so incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I also wanted to uplift this whole idea of, yeah, reconnecting to yourself and reconnecting to your past and really uplifting the relationships that your ancestors had to the land and really learning from that. Um, and this idea of paying attention to the land. I think, um, you know, like I've been spending a lot of time in Southern Maryland and uh, Nanjimoy. And, you know, that's, that's something that Gabby always says, you know, it's like, this is what happened with the land today, you know? And so I always find myself now, you know, like sitting down and like, okay, what is the Osprey doing? What is, what is the water looking like? What am I seeing today? Um, so I really, really do appreciate that. And um, yeah, let's open up the uh, space for conversation and any questions, comments that you guys may have. Um, that was a lot, you know, but um, yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts and you can put them in the chat. You can raise your hand or you can uh, mute yourself. Um, any, Adriana, do you guys have any comments? Just to thank Ashton because all the wisdom you have shared, I, every time we always talk after making Visuma, we always try to have or start with young people because it's amazing how young people can teach us so much that our generation have mess up everything in such a terrible ways, I think, that it's so refreshing to hear you. And connecting maybe with that, because uh, what about the tradition with ancestors to respect the knowledge that they have shared with us, but at the same time being ourselves and changing the narrative in new ways as young people that how you are doing this because you are respecting, you are bringing cultures, that ancestral cultures, but at the same time, you are completely changing the narrative and making it more accessible and making it more present and more powerful in some ways. So I don't know if you want to talk something about that relationship in you yeah. and elders and culture and new ways to, to share your culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think about that a lot um, in gen. I think about that a lot in general, but I've been thinking about it a lot in recent days as I'm thinking, I was doing preliminary exams and you have to like map out your entire dissertation proposal for them and tell them what you're going to be doing over the next few years. Um, and one of the things that I've always loved doing and hope to continue to do is oral histories. Um, I love talking to elders, um, thinking with elders and learning from elders. Um, and then I also recognize that there are places where like sometimes I disagree with them. Um, <laughs> and I think that's okay. I think that's okay because we like we are constantly learning and we are constantly changing and like connection doesn't mean like, you know, that everything's the same. It's like we come together and we connect so we can like grow and maybe like create like new cool pathways that might help us get further than like, than like the last generation maybe. Um, 
there's like stepping stones. Like you can't just go from over here all the way to over here, but if you can talk with one another and learn and grow, um, then I think that's super important. And there's like this very um, unfortunate and incorrect colonial myth that like in order to be indigenous, you have to be exactly the same as like indigenous peoples 500 years ago. And that literally is impossible. <laughs> um, it, you, people are always changing. People are always moving from one place to another. People are always reconnecting and building new relationships with one another. Um, and like, I think that in itself is a tradition of like learning and growing and like a tradition of continuing to stay in like connection to yourself and to the land in like any way that makes sense in the time that you're in. <laughs> so yeah, that's. Thank you. Gabby, I see your hand up. Hi. <laughs> well, I just um, thank you for um, Annie and Adriana for creating, again, creating this space of visibility in the community and, and Brenda also for, for curating such an extraordinary um, set of um, people. Like first two, like you said, I mean, Tomas last week was incredible. Ashton, um, first, uh, just to, to give you deepest um, respect and thanks uh, for being a credit to generations that fought for you to be able to be here and for you to pick up that torch. It is no small matter um, of the way that you're speaking and that you can also connect to the heart. You know, it's not so external, right? Like the, I think in, in generations before there was this incredible like, like push break through, punch through um, feeling and that you've been able to open up um, a tenderness, um, like, a, like a real tenderness in, in, um, in, in the way that you inquire and speak about it and it's a vulnerability um, also to be able to put that forward. And then when you said like, when Brenda was saying, it's like, yeah, you spoke what was in so many minds and helped to give voice to that. And knowing that there's a, a, a trajectory, right? Like it's a pathway, it's an intergenerational pathway. I, I'm always, I, I am curious, I asked this a little bit of Tomas last, week, last time and for you as well, wondering, you know, what what was it that, that helped you um, be able to pick up this intergenerational thread? Because it is not easy, you know, anywhere and especially um, coming from Afro-Indigeneity, being in Delaware, being surrounded, right? What, what if you could talk more about, you know, what, what sparked you to be able to to pick this up and continue um, in your own way, in, in within your own generational experience with the work that you do. Yeah, um, what did do it? I think many things. Um, I would say, honestly, I feel like what finally made me make a little bit of sh a shift in the way that I was approaching my work um, and the way that I was approaching, honestly, thinking about the world um, and like my place in it. Like I, I was like, you know, I was thinking about it from like here or there, like maybe, um, maybe the way that I'm thinking all the time <laughs> um, about these salvage anthropologists who have created these narratives about my people who have like have like justified like so many myths of like erasure and just like I was just like ah um, <laughs> um I think that's not that I don't think about it and I'll still be calling them out in my work for sure um but it's a lot more important for me now to think about um, my ancestors and my grandmothers and the land. And I think that became 
the most important it became to me last year. Um, just like in the midst of family emergency after family emergency after family emergency and the pandemic, um, being here in Minneapolis during the uprising, um, moving the year of the pandemic to a new city away from my family. Um, <laughs> All of those things um, really came together in a way that made me realize that the work I was doing wasn't sustainable for me. Um, to constantly be thinking about how anti-Blackness operates in the settler state and throughout Turtle Island, while important, wasn't sustainable for, for me. Um, and so then I started thinking about what made me feel happy in my work and what, um, like I wanted other people to feel happy <laughs> when reading my work um, or like asking me about what I do. Um, and that was black feminisms and indigenous feminisms. Um, which are basically just thinking about like black and indigenous women lives just like even if it's like a small little thing like I was out gardening today like that is an important piece of knowledge that needs to be talked about and uplifted um that my grandmother was doing some really good cooking in 1950 like <laughs> just like those are all important things that like should be so center in a Nanticoke Lenape history far more centered than all the other stuff that these people were doing because we were like living whole full lives in the midst of so many colonial violences. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt like I wanted to uplift that more. And one of the things that um, those ways of thinking which I've like now combined into Afro-Indigenous feminisms. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things that they do for me um, is I think they really respect first person narratives and personal narratives and things like oral histories, like uplifting Black and Indigenous women's voices. Um, and let me do things like write letters. So now my dissertation is gonna have a bunch of letters um, because I think it's a really good way of making a connection to the person who's reading a book and then making a connection, I guess, with whoever I'm trying to write to and maybe we can like learn something together. Um, but yeah, I think that's how I came to it. It was just like everything was going down and I needed a way to see back up. So that's that was my way. <laughs> Thank you. Just so proud of you and just love you. Thank you, Gabby, for that question and for that comment. I also love that you have a garden. I didn't know this. Um, I got to send you some seeds. And uh, actually, last year, I grew um, Nanticoke squash that I got from Corey from um, from Corey's garden, literally, like I just like picked the seed out of the ground from a smash squash and I grew it. And, you know, like to grow that, it was just so incredible to, and, you know, like now it makes me think of like, like appreciate the little things. Like when I put my hands into the dirt, when I put my feet into the water, that, you know, connection to that's, that's a connection to land or even when I'm just taking a shower. That's one of the things that I've come to really appreciate after coming back from Mexico. Like, oh my goodness, like the, the fact that I can have water. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate that. And, you know, we'd love to hear more about this connection that you have to the garden. And if you're interested in seed exchanges, you know, I'm also available for that. Um, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to grow an Anticoke squash. <laughs> well, I actually have some seeds, so I will be sending those to you. <laughs> Does anybody else have any more comments or questions for Ashton?
I also want to give a shout out to Denise Dunkley, who is Ashton's okay. mom, who is also here. She's here. Um, yeah, I see her name. Hey, mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've been have I've had the pleasure of being in community with Ashton, and also to Gabby's point, you know, uh, Ashton really comes from a really strong community. We went to uh, a longhouse ceremony. And, you know, to see older folks, to see folks from our age and to see little people praying and doing the ceremony and, you know, doing it together, uh, it was just so incredible. Uh, so I really appreciate that you're bringing that energy and you're really talking about, you know, this idea of being intergenerational because um, that's important. Yeah, it's so important. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that because that ceremony was like such a big part of why I started writing the way I did um, in that piece, because I needed to write something to pass a class and I wasn't writing because everything was a mess. Um, <laughs> And then I started thinking about how much easier it was for me to speak in ceremony when it was like I'm talking to a relative about how I'm like experiencing and seeing the world. Um, and the closest thing I could get to that at that point in time, I was like, I'll write a letter. To <laughs> um, and so like it very much so was the way that I'm, thinking about things has grown so much because of ceremony um, and like my relationship and way of seeing the land has grown so much because of ceremony and I think that's just such a really important part of the environmental justice movement um, is that like well like that relationship that it builds um, or that it's built for me um, but also it like lets you connect with yourself and connect with the land and connect with others. Um, and like, that's never good for the settler state. And so that's always nice too. <laughs> well, this is Annie. Um, Ashton, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just so much gratitude to you and everything that brought you to this work and how you're able to share it. Um, a few things came up for me. One is, I think one of the reasons so many of us have a, really appreciated Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching is that he comes from a very um, Vietnamese indigenous perspective, and there's a lot of connection with the land. And so I think that's one of the reasons it resonates with so many. And I think that's a human thing to want to resonate with the land, and that many of, many of us miss that, you know, living in this environment. The other thing I'm really loving is just it is sort of subtle, but it's how you've described finding your vocation as finding the joy and finding the part that you love so much, and then using that to direct how you're going to serve. Um, and I, I just think that's so beautiful and not, not often um, highlighted. And we think about what should we do? And it's something I've been thinking about really lately as like, how do I find that intersection between what, you know, is helpful to the world, but also what I love. So appreciating that. Um, and the third thing that really um, raised my, um, I don't know, energy and thinking was when you, you talked about how, you know, I don't know, I think you said ironic, but it's sort of ironic that at the end of the capitalist colonial world, now indigenous ways of knowing are sort of leading us back. And I remember being in India some years ago and driving through the countryside and seeing people working um, and meeting women who are working and doing things in very kind of traditional ways and thinking, yeah, when climate happens, they're gonna know how to live and I certainly am not, <laughs> you know, like, and I just think it's so important, you know, here we are at, and what do you think about all of that? Like, how do you frame that in your mind the way that, you know, kind of we've, you know, colonialism kind of screwed it all up. And now here we are coming back and being like, hey, remind us, you know. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it actually relates a lot to one of the things that I was, the one of the pieces I had brought up by um, Dakota scholar Waziatawin, um, which I believe the title of that is like the, 
the paradox of indigenous resurgence at the end of empire. Um, and she's like really wrestling with that, that paradox um, in a way that I think a lot of indigenous people are and that I definitely am is that like, we're seeing a rapid decline of this empire um, and empires, you know, portray themselves as very permanent, right? Like nobody saw the end of the Roman empire, but it ended. Um, <laughs> Nobody saw the end of the British. Um, it's a it's a pattern, um, and that opens a lot of space. Sometimes it opens a lot of space for people to start thinking differently. Like maybe this isn't as permanent as I thought it was. Maybe there is a way outside of this way that I've been taught is the only way to live and operate in this world. Um, and definitely, I think has drawn a lot of people's attentions to um, traditional ecological knowledge, um, uh, knowledges of in the indigenous peoples um, whose lands they're on. I was recently at a talk um, by Robin Wall Kimmer who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass and like the entire auditorium was filled. <laughs> um, the entire auditorium was filled and it was filled with people um, indigenous and or um, Turtle Island indigenous and non Turtle Island indigenous um, who wanted to find some way to like reconnect with the earth. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to do in a super respectful way that's not appropriative, that's not like, give me that next sort of thing, because the give me that land, like that didn't work. Um, <laughs> so I think like, I think that's like super important. Um, and I think that comes with turning towards indigenous peoples and like uplifting their voices and their communities and being like, this isn't working and you clearly, have ancestral knowledge about how this land, how to live on this land sustainably um, that your people have carried on. And like, maybe it's time that we listen to that um, and act and act and do what we can to help you and for all of us to act on that. Um, at the same time, a part of that paradox is that it's partially like an end or a turning point, sometimes ends or beginnings, right? Um, but the end of empire because it's not working anymore. Um, you can only exploit the land and harm the land so much before there start to be serious repercussions, um, which unfortunately does also impact like indigenous ways of being with the land. Like when I was talking about like being sad that like I can't eat the fish without thinking about how like those fish are poisoned, the water is poisoned and like I'm gonna be poisoned from that. Um, and so, you know, it's time sensitive. It's something where we have to act fast um, because in order for us to live sustainably on the land, like, you know, there's gotta be land for us to do that, land that we've respected. Um, and the land will, you know, will always be okay. Um, but like, we may not be. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's the important thing is that like the land will continue, Mother Earth, will, she will continue. Um, and like, we have to, we have to fall in line um, and like respect and like, you know, work within. I think it's really important to recognize the land. Um, you know, we talk about like human society, but there were whole societies here before humans were here that operated with, that operated and operate within specific, you know, Way, ways of being, they have their rules and they all, all of those things. Um, and so like to not listen to them and to not think about how they're living with the world is like incredibly arrogant to think that we know better. Um, so I think, yeah, th that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you, Annie, for that question. And thank you, Ashton. Also, I love um, from the very beginning um, how you talked about, how you said, you know, like you framed this as like 
what is my responsibility to the land and to the people of this land? And I really felt that question. And that's a question that I ask myself often. And, you know, like in thinking about like, what, how, how do we support? What do we do? You know, like there, I can't remember where I read this, but, you know, like um, in the, in the, in my office where I work at the Department of Energy and Environment, you know, we always talk about like how we have the technology and the amount to reverse the impacts of climate change. And there is sustainability plans from the United Nations, from Project Drawdown, which I quoted in um, the series description. So we, you know, like the, and you know, like, and we still gotta go, those are not the only solutions. We still gotta go in deep, you know, but we have this, we have the people, we have the knowledge, we have the technology and the resources to do it. Um, so yeah, I wanna encourage people to continue to think about this question of what is my responsibility to the land and the people of this land. Um, I really love that. And um, does anybody else have any more questions or comments for Ashton? This is Adriana again. It's no one. I, I, I just want to mention something that I have been thinking also as Brenda, I am just returning from Mexico City. And it's really, and um, Brenda and Anna Mendez is there. She's also from Mexico and Aranza. But the thing that I can recognize all the indigenous cultures in Mexico City, but the land, we have finished with the land in Mexico City. So it's really, we don't have water. We don't have green spaces. And the amount of people of the indigenous culture is there, but that connection with earth, we have lost it completely, I think. So how can you start like reconnecting with nature when we have finished nature already around us as in a city of 20 million, which is not a, a small thing to say, but how as a urban people who wants to reconnect yeah. With nature, how can we do, how can you tell us about that being in an uh, urban spaces and reconnecting with nature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, when I think about that, um, I think about how I find some hope in the fact that I don't think we fully finished with nature and that we are nature, right? We like, we're of nature. Um, and, you know, um, I think there is this narrative that like became clear to me actually when I was reading Braiding Sweetgrass, um, <laughs> where Robin Wall Kimmerer was um, talking and she's Potawatomi, I believe, was talking about um, how there's like a narrative that like people can only have like a parasitic relationship to the earth, like take, 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 consume, consume, consume. And um, Lenape's a scholar, like uh, Jack Forbes talks about that a lot too, like consuming and cannibalizing, but how um, we can work to actually have like a very regenerative, regenerative relationship to the land. We don't have to be in that um, we don't have to operate within that structure where like we like can only take from the land. Um, and like, you know, we like think about a lot how, or I've been thinking a lot about the Delaware River and how incredibly poisoned it has been um, and still is. And that made me sad. So then I was thinking about like, okay, well, we know like, um, that over time, right, the earth, um, the earth heals, the earth gets better, um, water is literally medicine, there are ways that the earth heals itself, um, and there are also ways that we can help it along, and I think when we think of ourselves as nature, and the fact that nature can be regenerative, right? Like we can also help with that like regenerative process. And I think that process in itself is a way of like reconnecting. 
um, like thinking about like urban garden spaces like there there's there's like small steps and it like pains me to think in small steps because I'd much rather be like in the woods clean water like <laughs> um and but I I think like you know, like as much as it pains me, I'm like, oh, I've got to accept the process, like the, not accept, but like I've, I've got, I got to recognize that it's okay that it's a process and that like it will get there. And like, and if I can't see it, maybe I can do something so that my grandchildren can see it. Um, that's sort of where I'm at, but I'm still like, oh, <laughs> so yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ashton. Thank you for that answer. And um, yeah, like Adriana said, I actually Googled, um, you know, like the town where I was staying in Mexico, where my grandma's living. Ooh. I was like, you know, like go Googling about the animals and the plants. And the first sentence was like, there, everything is like completely extinct oh. in uh, Nezahualcoyo. And that broke my heart. Uh, but, you know, like you said, um, there is uh, this quote from Casey Kent from the Ponca Nation from Oklahoma. Um, she says, We're, we are not defending nature, we are nature defending itself. And I think that brings so much peace and so much hope to my heart and to the movement. And yeah, it's not gonna be a fast, easy process. And the way that I've come to terms with it is that I am putting, I am, set, I am setting up the stepping stones for the next generation to have a path that they can continue to follow and a path that they can continue to design and create for their children. Um, so I really appreciate that. And we're two minutes uh, from closing the session. Uh, thank you guys so much for participating, for your questions. Ashton, I learned so much. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewatch this whole uh, presentation because I'm like, there, I'm still processing and I want to quote a few things. So I really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate you. And um, Annie, Adriana, I'm going to pass it to you so that you guys can close this out. Adriana, you got something to say before our final bell? No, no. Thank you, everyone. And after the bell, we can share about our social media and what other uh, uh, content we have in Making Visible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just um, no spotlight. All right. Oops. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, we'll just finish with the sound of a bell and we'll send our practice and our time here together and any benefits that we may have accrued from listening and learning together out to all beings everywhere, especially those who are suffering and struggling and including the earth and all beings everywhere. And may this practice and this work we're doing together benefit the world and the beings in it in ways that we don't even understand yet. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.